All right, hi everyone. This is lecture two of POS 201. Uh, today's lecture is going to cover the two pieces in the Khan book, the defense of Socrates and the Crito. Uh, so if you have not yet read those, you should pause this lecture and uh, finish up reading those. Uh, uh, to, to just kind of talk about both of those pieces really briefly, um, as I said last time, the uh, defense of Socrates is Socrates on trial for his life in ancient Athens, uh, essentially for engaging in the task of political philosophy. And so the Crito is kind of like the sequel to the defense. Um, at that point, he's been sentenced and he's contemplating his escape. So today we're going to talk about each. Um, a famous political philosopher, his name is Leo Strauss, he argued that in order to truly comprehend political philosophy, our uh, starting point needed to be the work of the ancient Greeks, especially the works of Plato. And he was really enamored with uh, Plato and called this the classical solution. So what's so special about the Greeks and why turn to texts that are a couple thousand years old for guidance on contemporary issues? Well, Strauss argued that this was an era uh, when some of the most fundamental questions about politics were asked with a clarity and a precision that really hasn't been achieved since. So he really focused in on um, the classical period, the ancient period, and uh, particularly the works of ancient Athens and, and the works of, of Plato. And that's, um, that's where we start off today. Today we start to do that. Um, so uh, we're looking at a piece by Plato which documents Socrates. And I should say a little bit about that. Uh, Plato was a, a student and a friend of Socrates. And he's actually present at his trial. Um, Socrates mentions him as being there in the defense. And as best that, as we can tell, Socrates never wrote any works himself. Uh, at least if he did, they haven't survived. We haven't found them, and they probably don't exist anymore. Uh, so Plato, after Socrates died, sought to document and transcribe uh, some of Socrates' dialogues. That was his method of philosophy. He engaged in these uh, dialogues. We'll see them here. Uh, the Republic is probably the most famous of these dialogues. And Plato was really the one that sought to kind of record those for posterity. But he's doing so, you know, oftentimes he's doing so years after they've occurred. Um, so we're kind of trusting Plato to a certain extent to, uh, to faithfully document and transcribe these dialogues and these events. And because of that, because Socrates never actually wrote and Plato um, was responsible for transcribing these dialogues, people often refer to them uh, kind of interchangeably. You know, they'll refer to Plato or refer to Socrates, but they're referring to the same ideas. And that's why, right? So anything that we um, read by Plato in here is simply his attempts to document the philosophy of Socrates. Uh, so just just so that's clear, right? Um, I, I figured I'd, I'd talk about that a little bit at the outset. So what are we going to do today? Um, whoops. We're going to talk about the defense of Socrates and a little bit about its broader meaning in political theory, right? So it's it's a dialogue, it's a trial, uh, it's kind of interesting. There's lots of interesting stuff going on, uh, but you know why do we? Why is it important? And why do we continue to turn to this dialogue? A couple thousand years later, what is its meaning in political theory? Uh, we're also going to assess the Crito and its broader meaning in political theory, and we'll close by talking about the relationship of these two pieces to one another. It's kind of strange um, if you look at the two different pieces. You know, potentially you're getting two very different political lessons from them. One very, very defiant and um, this kind of relentless questioning that we see in the defense. But in the Crito, you're getting another side. Uh, you're getting the importance of rule of law, the importance of obedience. And so we're going to try and uh, reconcile the two as best we can uh, to close. So that's what we'll be doing today. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the context and the setting of the defense, the trial that's actually happening. Um, now, sometimes you'll hear this uh, piece referred to, this piece of philosophy referred to as the apology. 
um, when I first read it as an undergraduate, uh, the way that they had translated the title of the piece was The Apology. And it seemed so weird to us, right? Because uh, there's nothing at all about Socrates that is apologetic. <laughs> uh, he is defiant. He is, he is you know, crusty. Uh, he, he's not in any way apologetic for his actions. And that's because of um, the translation. It, the Greek word for defense is apologia. Right. And so um, some people just literally translated that as the apology. But I think the defense is probably um, more accurate. It's probably a better title. He's uh, defending his actions. He's defending his actions pretty defiantly. Right. So but if you see um, if you see references to the apology or, or in some other work you're reading, they talk about the apology. Um, that's that's what they're referring to. And it's really it's just a bad translation. Don't let it confuse you and don't think that it's a different text. Um, so the setting, uh, Athens in the period in which Socrates lived was a direct democracy. Now in the United States today, obviously you guys know we have a representative democracy and not so in Athens. Citizens of Athens made their decisions directly in bodies that sometimes numbered in the hundreds, sometimes numbered in the thousands. Uh, so you had something called the assembly. Right? And that was the main political organ of the state. It was kind of like the, the legislature. And they would eat, meet in an assembly hall, and they usually numbered about um, 6,000. And, of course, everyone didn't get to participate. Uh, certain groups were excluded from these settings. So uh, slaves, this was a slaveholding society. Slaves couldn't participate. Women couldn't participate. Children, obviously, were not allowed to vote in those settings, and they're still not. We still don't give children political rights. Um, and also sometimes if you weren't among the first 6,000 to arrive, um, you'd be prevented from entering the assembly hall and there'd be this red rope that was put up around, uh, you know, to, to kind of block off the assembly hall. That was just a signal to people that showed up late or to people that showed up after, uh, everyone had already arrived that you aren't getting in. All right, and we have that today, even, you know, if you go to a, a nightclub or a restaurant, there'll be a, a red rope. And the origin of the red rope is actually um, from ancient Greece. So um, that wasn't only the case with the uh, political branch, right? That was the way that they made their political decisions. But that was also the way that um, the judicial branch of Athenian democracy, what's called the dikasteria, I think I pronounced that right, dikasteria. Um, in ancient Greece, that was how it was organized. So you had um, a potential pool of, ju of jurors that numbered around 6,000. And um, there was also, it was really important for them to evenly represent all of the different tribes that existed in ancient Athens. So there were 10 tribes in ancient Athens, and uh, some number had to be drawn from each of the tribes to ensure that it was evenly represented. And the size of Athenian juries was huge, right? If we think of contemporary juries in our courtroom, you know, we think of uh, 12 people, but in Athens, it's not the case. Uh, for private suits, there would be 201 people who would be selected from the pool of 6,000. For public suits, which is what was brought against Socrates in the defense, the number was 501. And for public suits that were deemed really important, that were very important cases, sometimes the number would be even higher. So sometimes you'd have 1,001 people. You'd have 1,501 people. Uh, in one case, they even had <clears throat> the entire jury pool of 6,000. They decided to have those people, uh, every single one of them, as a juror, right? So um, that is the setting <clears throat> in which Socrates is making his defense. It's not a small courtroom. It is probably a rather large arena or stadium. And his jury is uh, 501 of his fellow citizens. And these were events. Uh, so there would be spectators. There would be supporters. There would be dignitaries. Local leaders would be there, right? Um, so it's a big kind of public, a little bit raucous setting. It's, it's almost like a, a sporting event more than it is like our contemporary jury trials. Um, in a public case... This gets more into the logistics of the trial. In a public case, each side, so those that bring forth a public charge and those are, that are defending themselves against a public charge, they're given three hours to state their case. 
night. Each side gets three hours. And then at that point, the jury decides the verdict. And then there's this interesting component of the trial in which the side bringing the charge offers a potential sentence or punishment if the verdict is guilty. And then the defendant, even if they've just been found guilty, right, they offer their own counter sentence, what he or she thinks a sentence ought to be. And then that same large jury votes on that, right? So the jury um, hears each side present what they think the sentence should be, and then they vote on that as well. So um, that, in a nutshell, is a little bit on the Athenian political system and a little bit on um, the uh, Athenian trial system, the judicial system. So hopefully that gives you a, a, a better sense of, of what's going on in defense and, and some of the things that seem a little bit strange, like the fact that there's this big audience there, um, they start to make sense. Okay, so Socrates on trial. Uh, Socrates is on trial and he could face death. Right. That option is on table on the table for his uh, those that are bringing the charge against him. So he's potentially on trial for his life. So the question is, what is he on trial for? And it's kind of it's kind of funny, right? Um, technically, he's charged with um, corrupting the youth. The legal charges against him are corrupting the youth, and um, essentially believing in and promoting supernatural forces other than the gods, which are promoted and accepted by the Athenian city-state. Um, we don't have Christianity yet. This is a polytheistic society. They have many different gods that they believe in. And they're claiming that Socrates is kind of, um, you know, minimizing their accepted gods and promoting some other supernatural forces. But Socrates, in his defense, he distinguishes between what he calls the old charges and the new charges, right? And these charges above, he says, are the new charges, right? Um, the old charges are that, and this is a quote from the defense, that he is a criminal, a busybody, and one who inquires into what is below the earth and what is in the sky, right? Those are the old charges. Um, so, Basically, what Socrates is saying is that he is a public nuisance. Um, when he's saying he's considered a criminal, it doesn't mean that he's considered a violent individual. He's not assaulting people. He's not killing people. But he is just um, an old man. Right? He's very old at this point who walks around Athenian society asking questions people would rather not consider and would rather not answer. So the latest manifestation of people's discomfort with the fact that he walks around asking difficult questions in kind of an accusatory manner uh, are these new charges against him. But that's just the latest manifestation, right? That's just um, society has always found problems with Socrates and people like him. And so um, he's being charged with these new charges that he's a danger to the accepted form of spirituality, and he's being accused of leading young people into this heretical lifestyle. Right? Those are the charges which he's defending himself against. And so Socrates, in his defense, remember, he's going to get three hours to present his side. He begins to explain why he does what he does. right? And he begins to talk about the oracle at Delphi. So what is the oracle at Delphi? Um, the Oracle of Delphi, in ancient Athens, the Oracle of Delphi was a site or source of prophetic wisdom. Delphi was the temple devoted to the Greek god of Apollo, and inside the temple was a priestess called Apithia, who would offer prophetic wisdom when called upon. And it was viewed as emerging from um, divine sources, and it was considered infallible. Right? So the Oracle at Delphi would be consulted before any major decisions or undertakings. Uh, if there was going to be a war, if they were going to try to acquire colonies, right? they would consult the Oracle at Delphi. And there were other oracles in Greek society, but this was the major oracle. This was the major source of divine wisdom and guidance. Right? So the Oracle at Delphi says what about Socrates? Well, if you read the piece, you rem might remember that the Oracle of Delphi says that um, Socrates is the wisest man in all of Athens, right? 
And Socrates is a little bit puzzled by this. So he sets, the fig sets out to figure why the oracle would say something like that. Right? Why would they say that he is the wisest man in all of Athens? Um, and so how does he do that? Well, he decides he's going to go to all of the intellectual figures in Athenian society who are respected for their wisdom. And he's going to question them. Right? He's going to discover just how wise they really are and kind of get a comparative sense of how wise he is by, by uh, going to all of these different figures that are held up on a pedestal. Right? Um, and so first he goes to the sophists. Right? Sophists are individuals who make a business out of their wisdom. They're essentially like tutors. They instruct pupils for money. Right? And he finds that they are professing to have wisdom, which they often lack. Right? He'll question them, and he finds them claiming to know things which they couldn't possibly know. Um, so, you know, that's kind of his first step. And then he goes to the poets, and here he finds the same thing. He says they have this remarkable ability to express themselves in words. Right? They can craft words with tremendous beauty and tremendous richness. Right? We love to hear what the, the poets uh, are saying and writing. But he says oftentimes they know nothing of what they're actually writing about, right? The poets may be talking about a war, but they've never experienced war. Or they're talking about, um, you know, the tremendous natural beauty of some landscape that they've never seen, right? So that, to him, seems like this kind of artificial, questionable uh, sense of wisdom. And lastly, he goes to the craftsmen. And these are the individuals who are making things for society. So these are people who possess some incredible gift. They could be blacksmiths or carpenters or bakers, right? And they all possess some incredible skill, but the problem is they claim to know more than that, right? So the carpenter, he knows how to build these beautiful, you know, tables and uh, things out of wood that none of us could ever do. But the problem is that he's also going to tell you how you ought to conduct your finances or what you should be doing about your health, Right? So he's not competent to be telling you that, but strangely, he thinks he is. And so on this basis, Socrates, again, he asks himself, why then am I so wise? And he comes to this really interesting conclusion. He says, I am the wisest man in all of Athens. I'm wiser than all of these other people in just one small respect. If I do not know something, I do not think I do. Right? So the wisdom of Socrates, then, is that he knows the limits of his knowledge. And he doesn't claim to know any more than that. Right? That's his wisdom, strangely enough. Um, so wisdom for Socrates, in the Socratic sense, lies in knowing the limit of one's own knowledge and not professing to know more than you actually know. Right? Knowing the point at which, if you don't have an answer, you begin to seek out an answer and you don't claim to, to have a greater knowledge than you actually do. Um, now, obviously, in doing that, right, in going to all of these different respected members of society and questioning the extent of what they really know, he's made a tremendous amount of enemies. I mean, think about that. Imagine just for a day, if you were to go around and every encounter you had, any statement that was made to you, you questioned the intellectual foundations of the statement itself, the intellectual credibility and competence of the speaker, right? You'd make a lot of enemies doing that. We all know these people that are kind of contrarian, right? And we say something, and we know it. It's true, but they question us. Like, oh, I don't think that's true. You know, what's your proof? What's your evidence? And sometimes those people get on our nerves, right? And Socrates, this is basically what he does. This is his lot in life is to kind of go around and question people and um, question the base of their knowledge. And not only is he doing that, but he's questioning these people's confidence in the areas of expertise upon which their livelihood depends. Right? So if I'm a sophist, I'm going to be paid to instruct people. That, need, that means that there needs to be a general faith that I know a lot of things. And Socrates is damaging that. Um, so he's not well liked. Right? Um, he does have a lot of young followers, though, and um, they respect him for um, 
his nonconformity, his penetrating ability to undermine accepted arguments, and those figures in society that are accepted as the embodiment of wisdom. Uh, so um, he that charge of corrupting the youth, there's a certain truth in that, right? Because uh, he, he really does appeal to the youth, right? He appeals to all these young people that also want to question authority, and he does a very good job at it, right? So he has to defend this activity, and he knows that he's controversial. He knows that people hate him, but he has to find a way to defend what he's been, what he's been doing, right? And so here's his defense. Um, here he uh, says, first off, right, the way that I would defend this activity is I'm obeying a divine command. The oracle at Delphi has told me that I'm the wisest man in all of Athens, and I've set out to determine why. Right, so far from being a heretic, which is the charge against him, one who undermines the prevailing gods, he's actually obeying a divine command from the most respected and revered source of divine wisdom in all of Athens. Right? Um, and at one point he even throws out this hypothetical idea. Uh, I think this is on page 14, but he says, uh, you know, if I was simply asked to stop philosophizing, to stop engaging in philosophy, I, he couldn't do it, right? Because he would be um, obeying an unjust command of man while ignoring a perfectly just command of God, which is to go out and, you know, prove that you are in fact the wisest man in all of Athens. So that's kind of the first aspect of his defense, that he is obeying a divine command, and he's not a heretic. He's actually obeying what God is telling him to do. But there's this second aspect, right? And this is really important. I mean, this might be the most important um, aspect of the defense. And he says, um, by doing this, by walking around and asking people troublesome, difficult questions, he says, I'm actually playing a vital social role, right? Um, he says that he's playing the role of uh, a gadfly, right? And a gadfly, that word, uh, it's basically outdated terminology for what we might call today a horsefly, right? One of those big, nasty um, flies that, that bites you, right? Or stings you. I'm not specifically sure what they do, but, you know, it's not just a fly that you swat. It's one that actually can hurt you. And if it, you know, lands on your skin and either bites or stings you, you end up with a mark and you know it, it hurts, right? Um, so he says he's playing the role of, of a gadfly. And um, what does he mean by that? Well, essentially he's saying that societies are easily led astray, right? And he kiss, consistently shows that Athens, um, people within Athens need to retain a certain skepticism towards those who claim to possess knowledge. And we need to be mindful of the importance of questioning accept, accepted answers and those who purport to have the answers, right? So there's this skepticism, there's um, this critique necessary as part of reaffirming our reverence for truth, uh, understanding, even things like justice, right? If we don't continually question uh, not only the existing knowledge, but existing authority figures, then uh, we can very easily be led astray, right? Um, and furthermore, uh, this makes him rare, right? It's going to make him controversial, obviously, because he's taking powerful people and he's questioning them, and oftentimes he's making them look foolish, but uh, it also makes him really rare because that role is essential, right? And whoever is able to do that well is really a gift from God, right? So Socrates, in the second part of his defense, he says, you know, if you kill me, which is on the table, which could happen, uh, you're going to regret it, right? Because this is it's really important, this role that I play, this role of gadfly. Um, so, so that example, the gadfly, right? Uh, it's, it's interesting because essentially he knows that he's on trial for his life, right? And he's saying, well, um, you know, I, I'm playing this tremendously important social role. He says, I have literally been attached to God, by God to our city, as if to a horse, a large thoroughbred, thoroughbred, which is a bit sluggish because of its size and needs to be aroused by some sort of gadfly, 
the kind constantly alighting everywhere on you all day long, arousing, cajoling, or reproaching each and every one of you. And he recognizes that that's going to be a very unpopular role. He says, I dare say that you will get angry like people are awakened from their doze. You could happily finish me off and spend the rest of your life asleep unless God, in his compassion for you, were to send you someone else. Someone else like me, right? Someone else like Socrates. Um, so Socrates knows he's going to be controversial. He knows he's going to be disliked. But nevertheless, he argues that the need uh, for social critique and the need for someone who will question authority and question accepted truths is essential. And so if, if he's killed, if he's um, finished off, then society will regret it and it'll be a loss. Okay. Um, so the verdict, does Socrates convince the jury? Well, you know, you've read the defense by this point and you've also read the Crito and you know that the answer is no, he's found guilty. Okay. And like I said, in an old Athenian trial in ancient Athens, this was followed after he was found guilty, right? This is followed by suggested punishments in which each side gets to present, um, you know, what they think the punishment should be. And um, so there are suggested punishments. Obviously, the accusers suggest death. And the accusers are people who have been questioned by Socrates, you know, the poets, the sophists, they have been questioned by Socrates that they have been made to look foolish. It's potentially hurting their livelihood, hurting their careers. And so they want him gone, right? They want him dead. And um, the sooner, the better. So the accusers suggest death. And that's not really all that surprising, right? Socrates, on the other hand, um, suggests some interesting things as his potential punishments. And it kind of gives you a sense of uh, what a playful figure, what a defiant figure Socrates is, that he's just been found guilty. His accusers want him dead. And he has the potential to suggest other punishments and potentially get, you know, some sort of leniency to continue to live. And he kind of doesn't do what we might expect, right? So what does Socrates suggest? Um First, he suggests free meals at the Prytaneum, which is the city center. That's, um, that's kind of a benefit. That's actually usually reserved for prominent citizens and athletes. Uh, it's, it's not exactly a punishment. So his first suggestion is not really a punishment at all. It's actually, um, it would be kind of an honor to get free meals at the Prytaneum. Uh, he also throws out the possibility of exile, but he only hypothetically proposes it, right? He, he throws out the idea that he could leave Athens. He could go somewhere else. And his accusers would probably be perfectly fine with that, right? As long as Socrates isn't around to bother them or to potentially harm them as individuals, um, then that would probably be okay with them. But he immediately dismisses it, right? So he throws out the possibility of exile, but he immediately dismisses it. And why? So why does he immediately dismiss it? Well, essentially he says the exact same thing would happen. He says he would provoke anger, he would provoke animosity, no matter where he went, whatever society he went to, because he was going to continue to engage in philosophy. It's a divine command. He has to do it. So he'd provoke anger, he'd provoke animosity, he would draw young people into his circle, and he would ultimately be expelled from other societies. Um, and so the only way not to face that endless cycle is uh, to, to, you know, ultimately stay with an Athenian society, whatever the consequences might be. Um, and then lastly, he throws out the idea of a fine. And, um, you know, he said, I could kind of buy my way out of this. And he throws out a number, uh, which is the ancient Greek currency, um, a, a mina. He throws out one mina. That was his initial proposal. And uh, eventually his friends kind of chime in and they say, Socrates, what are you crazy? We'll, we'll support you. We'll give you know, whatever funds we can because we don't want to see you killed. Um, now, it's pretty much impossible to give you any sort of a conversion for what that would amount to today. Uh, a mina was a unit of currency in ancient Greece. A mina was composed of 100 drachmae. And um, to give you a sense of what 
that roughly translates to um, a pair of shoes in ancient Greece cost about eight to ten drachmae, right? And so his initial suggestion would have been the cost of about uh, ten pairs of shoes, right? And then with his friend's support, um, he eventually gets up to, you know, I guess several more pairs of shoes. But to kind of put it in perspective, imagine that you were trying to buy your life, right? You had just been found guilty of a serious crime. You were potentially going to be put to death. And imagine you offered up, I don't know, maybe $600 or $1,000. Uh, that's not a great sum of money, <clears throat> given the fact that your life is on the line, right? You'd think that whatever it takes, you sell your car, you sell all your possessions, you'll find some way to get more money than that. But Socrates doesn't suggest very much. And um, ultimately, you know, that's, that's what he offers up in terms of a fine. So you get the whole sense that Socrates isn't really, his suggested alternative punishments aren't really very serious. He can't honestly expect the court to accept those things. Okay. So the sentence, is Socrates successful? Uh, no. The jury votes for death, right? So he is this gadfly, this horsefly, and he's going to be um, swatted, right? He's going to be killed. Uh, he hasn't done anything violent. He hasn't killed or raped or murdered, but he has unsettled society deeply, right? And he has forced them to think, and he has forced them to question their foundations. And for that, he's going to be put to death, Um <laughs> and even, even after he's found uh, guilty and sentenced to death, he maintains that defiance. He um, says, well, that's okay. I don't fear death. Well, why doesn't he fear death? Um, a very kind of typical Socrates explanation. He says, uh, to fear death would imply that he is certain that the end of one's life is a bad thing. And he can't know that. He doesn't have the means to know that. So to fear death would be uh, a claim to possess knowledge which one cannot have. You know, Socrates cannot have knowledge of what death is like or what uh, any sort of, you know, what awaits us after death because he's never experienced it. So it would actually undermine his conception of what wisdom is if he were to fear death. So therefore he doesn't, right? Um and even, even facing death, Socrates is defiant. He, he sort of frustrates what we expect. We expect a man condemned to die, to sort of break down and plead to be spared. And Socrates isn't going to do it. Um, and and he, he's, he's going to remain critical. He's going to remain obstinate, even in the face of death. Right? Um, so that's kind of the close of the defense. And like I said, the key thing to get out of the defense, I mean, I think the most important aspects of the defense of Socrates are one, his definition of wisdom. It's a really influential philosophical idea that wisdom lies in knowing the limits of one's own knowledge, right? That's one really important part. And also this, no, this notion that um, social critics and those that criticize a society, they play an essential role. They're important. You need to have the glad, the gadfly. You need to have the person that's critical. Uh, and you should value and celebrate that person because ultimately they ensure that a society remains uh, just and uncorrupted. Right? That's another really important lesson that we draw from the defense. Um, so moving on to... The Crito, uh, like I said, the Crito is really kind of a sequel to the defense of Socrates. So um, now Socrates is in prison. He's been sentenced to death. He's awaiting his execution. And Crito, who's a friend of Socrates and a supporter, comes to see him. And he's trying to um, convince Socrates to escape. Um, so First off, before we talk about anything, we should note that um, the Athenians are waiting for something before Socrates can be executed. Right? So um, there's this delay between his trial and his execution, and he's kind of hanging around waiting. And uh, 
it's important to, to, to note what that is and maybe provide the context if that didn't make sense to you or you didn't pick up what was referred to there because it, it might not be immediately evident. Uh, but basically, they're waiting for this, this ship to come back from Delos. And the story behind this is that every year, annually, there was this sacred ship that would take a round-trip journey from Athens to Delos and back. Um, and that trip would take about a month. And that was, that was viewed as a sacred time in Athenian society. So Athenians would do their best during that time to remain pure, right? Um, and that means a lot of things with regard to how one behaves, right? You weren't supposed to be gluttonous. You weren't supposed to um, drink to excess, right? Um, in general, just in, in terms of um, even the administration of the state, there was an attempt to remain pure. They would, um, you know, if they could avoid it, they would not engage in military endeavors while the ship was on its its trip uh, to Athens, uh, to Delos from Athens and back, because that would involve killing and that would involve being impure, right? Um, so, so it's this general time in which the society itself tries to remain pure. And what that meant in terms of justice, in terms of the judicial, judicial branch, is no executions. Right? No one could be killed. No one could be put to death during that period. But once that ship returns from Delos, Socrates is going to die. And Crito comes to tell Socrates, listen, you need to escape. He says, um, the ship is going to be here really soon, right? It's going to be back from Delos. And if you're going to escape, right, if you're going to kind of make some final attempt to save your own life, uh, we, need to, we need to act as soon as possible. And so he makes this, this case to Socrates why he should escape. So let's go through that case. Um, why escape? Uh, it will be easy, <laughs> right? Uh, he says, um, essentially what he says is that the guards at the prison are very easily bribed, right? Um, when he, he's asked why he's in there so early, right? He shows up and Socrates is actually still asleep. And he's asked, how did he get in there so early? He says, oh, I did a small favor, for the prison warden, right? Implying that I paid somebody off and they let me in early. Um, he also says on, on page 23, I, it wouldn't take much to buy them off. He's referring to the guards there, right? So um, you have this corrupt prison system, corrupt society to a large extent. And um, Crito is saying, yeah, it'll be very easy to kind of buy your way out of this situation. He also says exile, um, which Socrates had thrown out and kind of dismissed pretty quickly. He says, that's possible, right? Um, he, Socrates had said, no, you know, if I do this, eventually the outcome will be the same as Athens. And Critus says, no. Um, listen, Socrates, there are places you can go. There are people who will support you, people who will fund you, work to protect you in a new society. Um, so exile is a possibility. He shouldn't rule it out automatically. Um, Crito also uh, says that he doesn't want future generations to think, or others within society even, to think that um, Crito and his friends were too cheap to buy Socrates his wife, right? So everyone in society knows that if they just come up with enough money, they can probably get Socrates out of this predicament. Um, and if that doesn't happen, they're going to think that they were unwilling or possibly too cheap to, to do that, to buy Socrates' life. And um, Crito doesn't want that, right? He doesn't want that, that tarnished reputation that would come with allowing Socrates to be killed. Um, he also says, Crito also says to Socrates that if you allow yourself to be executed, Right? If you let yourself be executed, uh, your opponents will have won. The sophists, the poets, um, all those people who just want to kill Socrates because he annoys them, then they'll win. They'll have gotten their way. And lastly, he, he, he tries to tug at Socrates' heartstrings a little bit. Uh, Socrates is a much, much older guy, and he'll probably be dead soon. 
Um, but he has these young sons, relatively young sons. And um, Crito says to Socrates, think of your young sons, right? You'll be, you won't be there for them. They're young. They're in their formative years. And if you die, you know, that's their father is going to be taken away from them. Uh, so Crito really, he offers a lot of very powerful reasons why Socrates should escape and um, has this kind of multi-pronged attack in terms of trying to convince Socrates to, to think about escaping, right? To think about bribing some people, breaking out of jail, moving to another society. Um, he he kind of makes a pretty compelling case. Now, knowing what we know about Socrates and how he's, you know, defiant and um, always kind of questions what seems to be the accepted wisdom or the accepted truth, we know, of course, that, you know, it's going to be more complex than simply saying, yeah, I agree with you, Crito, I'll, I'll break out of jail. Um, <clears throat> so Socrates, <clears throat> in his reply to Crito, right, he wants to talk about this more. He wants to kind of dig into the substance of this. Um, and he, he says, we need to move beyond whether or not it's possible. Um, because, yeah, <clears throat> you know, obviously I could do it, right? The guards are corrupt. Um, I could go into exile. There are ways I could survive. Um, and we also need to move beyond what would others think, right? We shouldn't care about reputation. That should be irrelevant. But he reframes it into one of these normative questions, right? He, he reframes this dilemma into um, a personal normative judgment, He's a good political theorist, right? And uh, he says, what we should really be asking is, would escaping be a just action? And by extension, he's really asking, why must we obey, right? Why must we obey the law? And so Socrates asks Crito to imagine, he says, imagine if we were to escape and as we left the society, as we are on our, you know, um, path to a, a new society where I was going to live in exile, um, we were confronted by something. Imagine we're confronted by something. What would they be confronted by? Well, imagine that we're confronted by the laws, the laws of Athens, right? Um, so he's doing something really interesting here. He's saying, forget about those that administered the laws. We know they're corrupt. Uh, we know that the accusers are not motivated by justice. We know that those who are administering the laws and those who ultimately voted to condemn Socrates are unjust. But imagine we are confronted by the laws. What would the laws say to Socrates and Crito? Um, well, the laws would say, according to, to Socrates, with this action you are attempting, do you intend anything short of destroying us? Do you think that a city can still exist if the legal judgments within it possess no force but are nullified and invalidated by individuals? Right. So if we could imagine the law as this kind of abstract form which would confront and question Socrates and Crito, then the laws would be kind of upset by what Socrates is doing. So what does that mean? Well, Socrates is basically saying that by escaping, he would be overturning the laws of Athens, right? And so why does this, why does he feel that this is so dangerous? Well, all while Socrates lived in Athens, he says, he had the right to exit. He had the right to leave, but he didn't, right? He knew that what he was doing was unpopular. He knew that he was going to face um, potentially, you know, prosecution for some of the things that he was doing, that they would drag him before the court and he would have to face justice. And in so doing, he consented to be judged in accordance with the laws of Athens, um, and now he's confronted with admittedly kind of a bad interpretation of the laws, 
but he can't simply reject the application of the law now, after the fact, because to do so would be to destroy the laws themselves and potentially render justice impossible. So he has to accept judgment even if he doesn't agree with the judgment. He has to accept the application of the laws, which he disagrees with because he has consented to the laws themselves by living in society and not leaving. Um, so it seems a little strange, right? It seems a little convoluted, but think of it this way. Um, imagine we're all going to play baseball and I'm the umpire and you're at bat and I call you out on strikes and you disagree. You say the pitch was a ball. Um, do you accept my judgment? Do you accept my bad application of what in theory is a just and sound rule? Or do you run down to first base and refuse to go to the dugout because you're convinced that I should have called it a ball and let you walk? Well, if the game is going to exist, it's going to continue to exist in any form, you've got to go back to the dugout. Because otherwise, if everyone begins to do that, if everyone begins to... Um, and disagree with the application of the law, sooner or later, we're not going to have anything that resembles baseball, right? So somebody gets called out trying to steal second base, and they decide they're not going to go back to the dugout, and, uh, you know, they stay on second base. Or, um, you know, you could just imagine, I don't know, think of like a little kid's t-ball, right? <laughs> Where they don't really understand the rules and they need their parents to coach them. Well, if you didn't have their parents there to coach them, eventually you'd have just chaos, right? And that's what Socrates is essentially saying uh, would happen if we were to disregard the laws, even when the application of the laws is bad, right? Is that if we begin to do that on an individual basis, then we undermine even the possibility of justice, we end up with a society that's just chaotic and awful. And so even when we disagree with the application of the laws, we have to accept it. All right. So therefore, he has to die. He must die. Um, and he does. He does. Socrates um, drinks hemlock and is, is killed. Um, so in the end, at the end of the piece, Socrates says, in effect, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but he says he'll leave this world as one who's been treated unjustly, not by laws, but by human beings. Whereas if he goes into exile, he'll shamefully return injustice for injustice and ill treatment for ill treatment. Right? So he's going to die. Um, now, what might seem kind of weird, having just read uh, the defense and the crito juxtaposed with one another, is that these seem like two very different models of how one ought to behave. Um, so if we, we think about the Socrates from the defense, he's the gadfly. His goal is to shock society. He's this endlessly questioning, endlessly critical um, kind of pain in the neck for society. But he argues that that is a socially valuable role, that that's an essential um aspect of what you need to have within society is this person who will criticize and critique and, and just be endlessly critical. But then you get to the Crito and you have Socrates, um, the obedient prisoner. He's accepting his fate. He's uh, resigned to be killed by the state. He's talking about the importance of obeying the law, the importance of accepting punishment. And that can seem kind of strange to us, right? It might seem like there's a little bit of a contradiction there. Um, particularly when we read these one after another, because it's just, it seems so, it seems contradictory. It seems like there's two different Socrates in a sense. So what are some possible explanations for this? Um, well, there are a number, right? Uh, there's a possibility that this is a deliberate tension, right? So remember Plato is telling this story. And so he has a little bit of artistic license here, and he can kind of present this um, as he wishes. If you think about the, the whole notion of the Crito, right, how would we know what Crito and Socrates actually discussed? How do we know that that conversation ever take, took place? How would Plato know, right? Um, so maybe he's kind of fabricating certain details, and, and maybe he's chosen to present this, this, these two sides of Socrates, so that we think 
right? We have to think about when we would be critical and when we must obey. Um, so in short, you know, maybe that's, it's important to have both a model of critique where um, we're thinking about how we can play the role of gadfly, but also a model of obedience. Um, you need that other side of obedience for society to continue to function. So maybe this is a deliberate tension. It's designed to make us think about, you know, when we engage in critique and when we play this kind of critical confrontational role and when we accept the law and accept certain outcomes. Um, maybe, right? That's one potential explanation. Um, also may think of Socrates in his death uh, engaging in an act of resistance. You know, maybe that's the ultimate act of resistance. Maybe to allow yourself to be killed by the state is to create a martyr. Um, he's possibly doing more for the cause of justice and philosophizing by allowing himself to be killed. He knows that this is going to be looked back on in history. He says, you know, at one point uh, during the defense, he says, you know, if you do this, you're going to be judged harshly by history. You're going to be the society that killed Socrates, right? And he's right to a certain extent. People look back on that period in Athenian history and they say, yeah, this is a society that killed Socrates. So what went wrong, right? So he knows that there's a compelling narrative there. And um, maybe he knows that we wouldn't be drawn to Socrates and what he had to say if he had spoken about the importance of, you know, uh, being just, uh, adhering to principles, and then he had kind of escaped his sentence and lived out the rest of his life peacefully, right? We'd, uh, he wouldn't be as compelling a figure. We wouldn't be drawn to his teachings if that were the case. It also demonstrates the importance of having convictions. Ultimately, Socrates is willing to die for his cause. He's willing to die for his ideals. He's willing to die for the cause of um, justice and philosophy. And that's, um, you know, we can, we can see that in other figures in political history. Uh, Socrates is actually cited by major figures in the tradition of civil disobedience. So uh, Martin Luther King, if you've ever read Letter from a Birmingham Jail, he talks about Socrates, right? He talks about um, the lessons of Socrates and was clearly influenced by Socrates. Uh, Gandhi, right? Essentially, that notion of um, doing something that you know is in violation of the law, but accepting the consequences of it, that's the model of civil disobedience. If you think of what the civil rights movement was doing in the 1960s, um, you know, refusing to move to uh, the back of the bus, refusing to uh, vacate diners and, and public places that were whites only, Right? They knew that that was against the law. They knew that that was against segregation, but they were going to do it and accept the consequences. Um, if you think of the anti-war movement in the 1960s, occupying university administration buildings, if you think of Occupy Wall Street right now, um, you know, occupying public spaces, defying public orders to leave certain public places, um, that's, act, that's an act of civil disobedience. They're accepting the potential consequences of that. They know it's against the law. They know that they can potentially be found guilty and face certain consequences for it, but they do it. They do it anyway. And so maybe Socrates is kind of, you know, he's um, one of our first figures of civil disobedience, perhaps, right? Um, so anyway, I don't know that there's a resolution to this. I don't know that there's an answer. I don't, you know, this is one of these things that you... Um, struggle with and you continue to think about every time i read um the defense and, and the crito together I, i'm kind of left wondering at the end myself um why there's seemingly these very different uh perspectives at play in uh the defense and the crito but um but that's kind of you know that's the beguiling nature of of um, Socrates and, and Plato is that a lot of things we still question, uh, you know, did they really mean this? What was the, the intent behind presenting this in this way? And we don't really know. 
Um, and some people say that even that's conscious, right? Uh, if everything were laid out really clearly, then we won't have to think about it and we won't have to kind of question internally and question ourselves. So these are just some possible explanations. You may have others. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. So uh, anyway, uh, that kind of wraps up our look at the defense and Crito. Uh, today's video, this is one of these ones that's kind of, it's a little irreverent. Um, I don't know. If there's a single insight to be drawn from the defense of Socrates, that kind of defiant, obstinate uh, Socrates, it's question authority, right? And question authority relentlessly. Um, and so I was trying to think of a way to pair this that, that might be kind of exciting and fun. And I started thinking about punk rock. Um, and particularly, you know, the kind of, I don't know, bratty, um, defiant punk rock of the 1970s, not Green Day or any of that stuff. I don't even think you can call that punk rock, but, you know, the Clash and the Sex Pistols and the Ramones and that sort of punk rock, the kind of early punk rock. Um, and I realized that, you know, that's the ethos of punk rock as well. Question authority relentlessly. And that's what they did, right? Um, and so I have this clip. It's the story of punk rock. It's a really good documentary that was done on punk rock. It's only the first 10 minutes of it, though. Um, and I'm interested in, you know, whether or not you see continuities between that mentality, the mentality that we see in this little clip on punk rock and Socrates, and also how Socrates is, is different or more restrained. So um, after, this, after you finish watching this lecture, uh, if you want to check out that clip and then head over to the discussion board. I'd be interested to see what you think. Um, so that kind of wraps up today. Uh, for next time, you're reading a hefty chunk of um, The Republic. It's, it's a lot to work through, um, but I think you can do it. It's basically books one through four of The Republic. Um, the Republic is probably one of the most important philosophical works in Western history and Western philosophy. It's the first systematic philosophical treatment of the question of justice, and it looks at justice both at the individual level and at the state level. So it's an essential work of Western political philosophy. Uh, I think after we kind of go through it and talk about it a little bit, um, you'll begin to notice how the Republic is referenced constantly. I mean, in pop culture, in uh, political writings and political speeches, uh, in movies and film. I mean, you just see all sorts of different references to the Republic because it's that important and that influential work. Um, so we'll finish up there and uh, next time we'll talk about that.